All right, let's look at what happened in Outlander Season 7, Part 1. When we left, Claire was in jail for Malva's murder, and Jamie was writing to her, having been saved by Ian and the Cherokee. We open with Claire standing on the gallows, being hung for her crime. Jamie wakes, revealing it was a nightmare. Claire makes friends with her cellmate Sadie Ferguson, who's been there a month. No trials are being held as the justices are in hiding. Roger is continuing his journey to become a minister. While speaking to some soldiers, he says, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, and is surprised when someone recognizes the modern quote from Muhammad Ali. Turns out Wendigo Donner is among the men. Roger recognizes him from Claire's attack, but Donner asks for help, saying he just wants to get home. In need of a healer, Claire is taken to a ship to see Governor Martin's pregnant wife, and she manages to gain her trust. Claire asks the governor for more medical supplies. He agrees to send a list, but won't allow her to leave the ship. Major McDonald shows up and recognizes Claire. Bree discovers that Roger has a pack for Donner, intending to help him escape. Bree reminds him that Donner didn't help Claire. Roger shows compassion, revealing the time he was forced to stand by and do nothing while working for Bonnet, but Bree walks away in frustration. In Wilmington, Lieutenant Tate finds Tom Christie at Claire's request and gives him her supply list. One of the things on the list is Vermuse, which means my husband. Jamie has arrived at Wilmington and Christie finds him explaining where Claire is and he immediately goes to her. Governor Martin and Major McDonald use the situation to coerce Jamie to agree to collect an army and fight for the crown. Roger goes to Bree and says the only help he will offer Donner is prayer. Jamie is back in Wilmington, forming a new plan to rescue Claire when he runs into a drunk Tom Christie, who reveals he plans to confess to his daughter's murder. At his request, Jamie tells him what he would have said at Tom's funeral, a nice speech about being honorable and having mutual respect for one another. Christie shows up on the boat and tells Claire that he is confessing. He reveals that Malva was not actually his daughter and was a witch like her mother. Claire doesn't believe he killed her, but Tom says Malva tried to poison them both and then confesses to being in love with Claire. He asks her to allow him to give his life for one that is worthy. Claire and Jamie are reunited on the docks, and she is left feeling a lot of guilt over Christie sacrificing his life for hers. That night, Richard Brown returns to his room to find Jamie waiting for him. He found him by recognizing his horse. He says he stared at his ass for 200 miles. He'd know it anywhere. Brown remains smug, and they exchange words. Jamie tells him to make peace with the Lord. The screen goes blank here, but I think it's fair to assume that Brown won't be a problem anymore. After a time jump, which you can tell from Claire's hair growth, Claire finds Alan Christie at Malva's grave. Alan confesses to both his inappropriate behavior with his sister, Malva, and to killing her because she was going to tell Claire the truth and said she didn't love him. He attempts to off himself, but Claire stops him. A quick arrow to the back shows that Ian decided to resolve the matter. Mrs. Bug finds them burying Alan's body, but says he must have deserved it and helps them. Bree gives birth to a baby girl named Amanda. All seems well, but Claire notices symptoms of a severe heart defect she cannot fix, but modern medicine can. Mandy's only chance of survival is for Bree and Roger to take her through the stones. Unsure if she can travel, they try to test Mandy with a gem, and Jemmy assures them she can hear the buzzing, one of the early signs of extra abilities Jemmy and or Mandy may have. They pack up and head to Wilmington preparing to leave for the future. In Wilmington, Bree runs into John Gray and William, her first and possibly only chance to meet her half-brother who is fighting for the crown. She encourages Gray to tell William the truth, but Jamie and John agree that is a bad idea, and John gives him the gemstone he's kept all this time. Bree and Jamie have a lovely scene together. Honestly, this setting is breathtaking with all the fireflies. They talk about their relationship and Disneyland. Bree tries to describe Mickey Mouse, and Jamie laughs about a giant rat they let children play with. Later, Jamie reveals to Claire that he has dreams of the future. At the Stones, there is a long, tearful goodbye before Brianna, Roger, Jeremiah, and Amanda touch the Stones and vanish. On the other side, they realize it's worked when a plane flies overhead. Claire and Jamie struggle to continue on, trying to count their blessings, while Lizzie has a little boy. One day, Wendigo Donner shows up and demands help from Claire. She tries to tell him what he wants to know, but he also needs gemstones, so he brought a bandit crew with him. 
They trash the place looking for gemstones. Mr. and Mrs. Bug are brought in after thieves found gold Mrs. Bug was hiding. You can see Jamie is surprised by this. The idiots smash all of Claire's medicines, including the ether. Then, needing more light, Donner strikes one of Brianna's matches, and we see the resulting explosion as fire engulfs the house. And now we are back to the future, where a box is delivered to Fiona, who then gives it to Bri and Roger. Some time has passed, and they say Mandy is doing well. They open the box to find letters from Claire and Jamie, and a single musket ball. The letters explain that Claire, Jamie, and the bugs were able to get out just before the explosion. Realizing Bree's matches caused the fire, Roger has a great line saying the 18th century was lucky to have survived them. Back in the past, they attempt to put out the fire, but it's a lost cause. The next day, they search through the rubble. Jamie finds the chest with his kill inside undamaged. Thank the heavens for that. Ian finds Jamie's prized picture of William and admits he's figured out Jamie's secret about him. Lizzie and Joe break the news that they can't find the cat, Adzo. When Mr. Bug begins searching through the rubble, Jamie confronts him about the gold. He admits it is part of the lost Jacobite gold of Charles Stewart, explaining he found and stole it from River Run, Jocasta's late husband Hector being one of the three men who split the treasure after the war. Jamie tells him to leave and never return. When told, Mrs. Bug hints to them deserving the gold after all the work they've done and the secrets they've kept. That night, Jamie and Ian stake out the rubble, waiting to see if Mr. Bug comes back. When they see a figure, Jamie confronts him. The figure shoots at him, so Ian takes him down. They are both shocked to find it was, in fact, Mrs. Bug, not her husband. Ian is distraught, having been so close with Mrs. Bug for so long. After the funeral, he offers to let Mr. Bug kill him, a life for a life. But Mr. Bug says it's not equivalent, claiming he'd see him again when Ian had something worth taking. Jamie melts down some of the gold into musket balls, look familiar, and hides the rest in a cave that he and Jemmy found. He then writes a letter to Bree, giving clues to its location. Back in the future, Bree and Roger are quickly able to decipher the clues, but decide not to ask Jemmy about it just yet. Bree takes Roger to see the ruins of Lollybrock, and they discover it's actually for sale. Jamie shows Claire where he wants to build their new house, but reveals he'd like to go back to Scotland first, both to take young Ian home and avoid fighting a war against his own son. He also describes a dream he had of the future with Jemmy on a phone, but also includes Fiona, whom he should know nothing about. Interesting. As they head out, Claire hears little Adso in the woods, happy to see he's alive and well, near the very first stake that Jamie ever planted at Fraser's Ridge. Looking forward to 1980, Bree and Roger bought Lollybrock and are renovating it. Their contractor tells them it will cost more than expected, because even in the 80s, contractors be contracting. Roger's going through his writing of their travels and accidentally discovers the musket ball is made of gold. Jem has taken to blaming fairy folk for his misbehavior. Bree interviews for an inspector job at a nearby dam, where they are skeptical of hiring women. She talks circles around the guy, literally asking what part of the job requires a male appendage, and ends up getting the job. In the past, William is waiting for his orders and intervenes when fellow soldiers are terrorizing a poor woman from the brothel. His cousin Henry stops him from causing even more of a scene. The captain hears of the deed and tasks William with secretly delivering very important messages to key individuals. While traveling, his horse gets spooked by a snake and he falls, injuring his arm as his horse runs off. Jamie, Claire, and Ian travel to Wilmington, Ian very paranoid about Archbug's earlier threat. In town, Harnett from the Sons of Liberty finds Jamie and attempts to coerce him to join the Continental Army instead of heading to Scotland. Jamie speaks with Claire and all three decide to stay, Jamie to fight, Claire to heal, and Ian to liaison with the Indians. Claire unexpectedly runs into a very much alive Tom Christie who immediately plants one on her. Her shocked face here is priceless. Tom explains his education made him useful so they did not execute him and then the rebels took the town and he was a free man. He heard about the fire at Fraser's Ridge and placed the obituary. You know, the one that caused Bree to time travel in the first place? They have tea, and still in love, Tom calls Claire a most uncomfortable woman. Injured and horseless, William stumbles around for a bit, but Ian finds him and helps better tend to his wound. They each slowly realize who the other is, and Ian takes him to a nearby cabin where a doctor lives with his sister. Denzel and Rachel Hunter are Quakers who have been kicked out for supporting independence. Knowing the secret relationship, Ian gives William Jamie's rosary. 
Denny is able to save William's arm, and the sparks fly between Rachel and Ian. He takes off, but eventually all of them head in the same direction. And we see that Jamie and Claire have just arrived at Fort Ticonderoga. In the future, Jem and Mandy talk about seeing a Nuklavi, a horse-like demon. Jem admits he was lying before, but swears the Nuklavi is real. At Fort Ticonderoga, Jamie notices a vulnerability in their defenses and tries everything to get General Fermoy to listen, but the Frenchman is snarky and dismissive. William travels with the hunters, discussing their Quaker values of nonviolence. They take a wrong turn and end up at a cabin with one Mr. Johnson and his wife. They are served a disgusting rat stew, and that night, as William wakes with a stomach ache, he sees the Johnsons coming down to attack them. William manages to take out the man, then goes to save the hunters from the wife. In the future, Bree starts her first day as plant inspector, meeting one Rob Cameron. He and the other men trick her and lock her in the tunnels. Bree uses her wits to turn on the lights and find her way. At one point, she comes across a mist that emits the same buzzing noise as traveling stones. She closes her eyes and runs through it, emerging on the other side unharmed and making her way out of the tunnels. Ian is asked to liaison with his former Mohawk tribe. Once there, he finds Emily quickly, and she greets him warmly. She says she's happy and introduces him to her son, Swiftest of Lizards. This is 100% Ian's child. Like, there's no mistaking it, right? Emily even asks Ian to give him a name from his people, and he chooses Ian James. At Ticonderoga, Claire is treating a traumatized and paranoid Mrs. Raven when she hears arguing. The hunters have arrived, and Denzel is arguing about where to amputate poor Walter's leg. Claire weighs in, and the lieutenant takes his tools and leaves in a huff. Denny is immediately impressed by Claire, and they work together to help Walter. Ian returns and runs into Rachel, and they have some adorable banter. The British begin to gather on the hill, posing a real threat to the fort. Wouldn't you know, it's exactly where Jamie had warned them about. So he's been preparing boats. The whole place must evacuate. Walter can't be moved yet, so he must hope the British show him mercy. Bree takes off and confronts the guys from work. She jokes with them, but makes it clear they are not to do something like that again. Jamie's crew, known as Fraser's Irregulars, got the civilians to safety by boat. Once ashore, they hear battle cries nearby and split up, Jamie and Ian going to scout the situation. The others move deeper into the woods, but a very paranoid Mrs. Raven goes missing. Claire goes looking for her and finds her cowering in the woods, so scared she takes her own life. As Claire rushes to her, she is captured by redcoats. In the future, Jemmy is in trouble for swearing at his teacher in Gaelic. Though technically he didn't swear, he called her haggard old goat breath daughter of a witch, which, come on, that's solid. The problem is more the use of Gaelic, and the principal asks Roger to teach a class to the kids to help them better appreciate their culture. Jamie and Ian neutralize the threat and return to find Claire missing. They track her back to Fort Ticonderoga. Reluctantly, Jamie allows Ian to sneak in as the Mohawk are aligned with the crown. Inside the fort, Claire resumes caring for her patients. Poor Walter has taken a turn for the worse. She marches up to a soldier demanding water and supplies, only to realize she is speaking to William. He recognizes her and agrees to help how he can. Shortly, some soldiers bring supplies, being told to give them to the curlywig giving orders like a sergeant major. Claire uses the herbs to try and help Walter, but it's too late, and he passes. She spots Ian, but as he starts to tell her the plan, William sees them. He wants to thank Ian, but then remembers their relation. A well-timed distraction from Jamie causes an explosion in the background, and Ian and Claire convince William to let them go, though he tells Ian they are even now. They meet up with Jamie and then join the rest of the Continental Army. Daniel Morgan recruits Jamie to his riflemen, and their trip to Scotland is delayed even longer. Ian uses Rollo as a means to continue his flirtations with Rachel. Roger has continued to work on his novel about their time traveling, but Bree accidentally packs the manuscript with his Gaelic books as he leaves to teach at the school. Bree's colleague Cameron is attending the class where Roger teaches history and leads them in a traditional walking song. The class is well received, and Roger is asked to continue the lessons. Afterwards, Cameron approaches, having found his time traveling manuscript, but he makes light of it as science fiction. Then he basically invites himself over to dinner at Lollybrock. Later on, Roger is cooking in the kitchen when he spots a man peering in the window. He catches him, a look of recognition on his face, then he punches the guy. Turns out the Nucklevy is Roger's ancestor, William Buckley Mackenzie, who accidentally traveled through the stones and recognizing him followed Roger home one day. 
he didn't just ask for help as he was the one who got Roger hanged at Alamance. Roger finds the family tree and it says Buck died the year he went through the stones. Cameron shows up unannounced and they host him for dinner with Buck hiding in the priest hole. Cameron invites Jemmy to the movies with his nephew Bobby and after he finally leaves they find Buck hanging out with the kids in the camper watching television. Wanting him supervised, Buck goes to work with Bree where he refuses to shake Cameron's hand, saying he smiles too much in her direction. William is anxious for war, convincing General Simon not to send him on a mission that would have him leave. As the men line up for battle, William exchanges banter with his good friend Sandy, but is shocked when the battle starts and poor Sandy is immediately taken down. The sobering reality of war causes William to lose himself for a moment. But Fraser calls to him and he leads the charge into battle. At night, Mandy screams and says Jemmy is gone. Because of their connection, she can tell he's no longer there. They figure out that Cameron believed what he read after finding the letters and has taken Jemmy to the stones. Roger and Buck race to the stones, but only find Jemmy's scarf. William instructs his men to bury their fallen comrades appropriately and then helps them. Later, Fraser tells him he's a changed man now. As we look over the battlefield full of casualties, we see Jamie lying on the ground, not moving. Scavengers loot the bodies and get to Jamie when Claire steps in and threatens them away. Jamie is alive and she chastises him and his hero complex as she helps him back to camp. She eventually performs yet another surgery on his hand. Roger and Buck return to Bree and he decides he's going after Jamie. Buck insists on going too. After some teary goodbyes and looks of resolve, Bree and Mandy watch the two men vanish through the stones. Claire sends Ian with some grease to give to Denzel, but Ian finds Rachel instead. After he drops it and they both bend to get it, touching hands, Ian kisses her. She slaps him and says they must not, to which Ian reluctantly agrees, thinking of Archbug. After this, Rachel speaks with Denny, who warns her not to pursue Ian. He says that while he was kicked out of the Quaker, she was not, but marrying Ian would never fly with them. Claire gets into a philosophical discussion with an articulate man she soon learns to be Benedict Arnold. Claire tells Jamie about Arnold's reputation, but they understand they mustn't change anything. Daniel Morgan gives a speech to the men around the fire, exposing his scarred back that looks just like Jamie's back, also courtesy of the British. The Second Battle of Saratoga begins. Jamie is ordered to shoot Simon Fraser, but he hesitates and shoots at an officer, who turns out to be William. Luckily, he only hit his hat. Someone else lands the shot on Fraser, and the British retreat into the walls of the fort. Jamie leads the charge to climb the walls, and the battle is won. Claire treats Benedict Arnold, who talks about his fury with his situation and saying he wants to be remembered. Oh, the irony. Claire assures him that he will be. A British soldier comes to request Jamie's presence in their camp as Simon Fraser is dying. Jamie and Claire go and he is able to help his cousin pass as peacefully as possible. They run into William and Jamie gives him his hat to replace the one he shot. Walking away, he tells Claire he wanted a chance to speak to his son as a man. Back at camp, Jamie is asked to escort Fraser's body back to Scotland. He agrees, taking Claire and Ian with him. Ian asks Rachel to watch over Rolo while he's gone. She accepts because she knows it means he will return. Later, Rachel and Rolo run into an old man who turns out to be Archbug, who finds the whole arrangement very interesting. On the ship, Ian misses Rolo and Jamie suffers from seasickness, but the bell rings and they all feast their eyes on Scotland for the first time in several years. And that's where we leave Outlander Season 7, Part 1. Thanks for watching. Please take a moment to subscribe to my channel. It's what allows me to continue making these recaps. And I'll see you in the next video.